Dr. Patrick O'Shaughnessy, President CEO of Catholic Health, thrilled to be here today with celebrity chef Tom Calicchio. I can't thank you enough for spending time with me today. Of course. It's just wonderful to have you here. Happy to be here. So, you know, I get asked this question a lot, you know, Patrick, when did you know you wanted to be a doctor? And I'm sure you get this question a lot, Tom. But when... being a doctor, no. Not... <laughs> <laughs> How about a chef? I mean, you know, the incredible career that you've had and you're doing now. Yeah. When did you first know? Um, so what's really interesting, if you look at my high school yearbook, underneath the photo, it says plans to be a chef. Um, so it goes pretty far back. You know, I, I enjoyed cooking at home. Uh, again, reflecting back on it, it's... it's you know, family time was so important around the table, yes. um, especially holidays. But every, every night, we had to be home. Um, uh, and so uh, food was always important. And at some point, I started cooking, and it wasn't... I think the first thing I made was, like, pancakes. And I looked at a box and go, I, I think I can handle this. <laughs> um, and, um, but uh, it was just something that I loved, and it came very easy to me. Um, but uh, and at a certain point, I think when I was about 15 or 16... My dad, and I, you know, I didn't have the kind of dad that we had these long conversations about, the, you know, my future. Sure. Um, but he just suggested I become a chef. Yes. And I, I don't think he ever envisioned what that would be. Um, um, I think his idea would be, uh, you know, I was in a red sauce Italian restaurant uh -huh. with a, a wife beater on, you know, sure. and a dirty apron <laughs> with a cigarette hanging out of my mouth, stirring, <laughs> stirring the sauce. Making sauce, right? Yeah, but. Um, uh, so yeah, that's that was so. I mean, you know, you're you're kidding with the pancake thing, you know. But at the end of the day, similar background. So I am half Italian, and I I, I couldn't agree more. Food brings the us other together. Half Irish, I imagine. Yes, on the other, <laughs> just a wee bit Irish <laughs> yeah, too. Yeah. There. Well, my middle yeah. name is Patrick. Oh, there you Why? go. My father was Thomas Patrick. Why was he Thomas Patrick? He was born March 17th. You're kidding. Yeah. So he's born on St. Patrick's was, Day. Yeah. We'll have to make sure we invite you to the parade with us. Uh, it's a <laughs> wonderful event, although it's it more liquid calories, of well, course, at that course, point. Yeah. Uh, but but, but yeah. I, th I, I think you can live on... on uh, Guinness? Guinness. You yeah. can live on Guinness. I think there's enough, there's enough it's nutrition. It's very nutritious. There. Yeah, there, apparently there is. What would, but what was, you know, as you reflect back, what was one of the first, you know, real dishes that you made? I know we talked a little bit before about our heritage growing up, some of the fishing, clamming, the sauces. What, what resonates with so, you? I remember, probably I was 14 or so, most likely was being punished because I was with my mother and my cousin's hair salon. So I'm assuming I was being punished and I had to go with my mother. Um, and I remember there was a bunch of magazines on the coffee table. Mm -hmm. And while I was waiting you know, for my mother to finish up, I picked up, which was Qu Cuisine Magazine, which is long gone. Uh -huh. um, and there was an article about Cajun cooking, and this was before Emeril Lagasse or Paul right. Perdome or any, any right. and it was an older you know, black woman on the cover um, on her porch in like, rural Louisiana somewhere. And I started reading about this food, and I remember looking at the recipe, and it was a recipe for stuffed eggplant, and it was stuffed with eggplant, zucchini, uh, like onion, garlic, and, and, and then also shrimp. And I was like, oh, this would be nice. And I made the dish uh, for dinner, and I served it, and they were like, okay, where's the rest of the dinner? <laughs> it was an appetizer. It, was, it wasn't an entree. So my, my, my mom had to bail me out. Um, and it was right around this time that um, uh, my father brought home uh, a few books. He said he got it from the library where he worked. Uh -huh. Now, I, I had no idea what Jacques Pepin's Law Technique was doing in a county jail library. Uh -huh. But there it was. He brought it home. And what was interesting about this book, it wasn't about recipes. Uh, it was a book stressing techniques and methods of cooking. And the issue that I had um, was I had, would have most likely been diagnosed with ADHD. All of my, sure. my children sure. are clinically diagnosed. They all sure. had psych, psych evaluations. And so I struggled reading these recipes, like wow. trying to understand what they were getting at. Not, yeah. not actually reading them, I can yes. read them, but to trying to you know, get through it. And my mind would wander and I would just, so I didn't see that this was an appetizer and I just made the dish. And then once I understood that it was about techniques and methods, it completely unlocked food for me and, and this idea of what it could be. Because this idea that if you learn how to braise a, 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 a lamb shoulder, you can braise anything. Right. And if you learn how to cook one green vegetable, you cook them all the same. Right. And so that, that really changed things for me. Wow, that's so interesting. So, you know, in medicine, everything is very prescriptive. And, and so, you know, it's interesting. There's, there's certainly a science, but there's a clear art sure. to what you do. So you're as much artist as you are, you know, clinical scientist yeah. in terms of in the kitchen, right? Bringing this all together. Yeah, but the, the artistry is different than most people think. Because okay. the real art in running a restaurant kitchen, it's not about the recipes. The dishes, yes, there's a certain 
uh, artistic, uh, you know, uh, you know, you can ascribe to plating a dish and making it look pretty, whatever. But the real art in running a restaurant kitchen is taking that dish. So, you know, go buy Thomas Keller's, you know, cookbook. Yes. Very complicated dishes. If you're a decent home cook, you could probably master a dish or two, right? Good luck taking that dish and putting it into a restaurant yes. where you have to produce it. Wow. You know, for 150, 200 people a night, night after night. Consistently do it. That's the hard part. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, what advice would you give for younger chefs coming up the ranks? So there's the, the piece you just described, learning the art, but then there's also the business aspect of it and the consistency. In healthcare, we have customer service, you know, excellence. Sure. We need to deliver exceptional quality, exceptional experience of care all the time. Same thing in the restaurant business, right? Well, in a, in a restaurant business, listen, people come back to restaurants, they'll go because they hear there's good food, they'll come back if there's good hospitality and, and service, and they're, they're different things. Um, Interesting. And you probably would yes. experience this in a hospital setting Same. as well. Same. You have service, which is the technical side of doing things. In a, in a restaurant, it's placing the silverware, silverware down quickly, um, making sure the wine is poured at the right temperature and things like that, making sure your food gets out on time. But then there's hospitality. And that is how that all happens. Yes. Um, and hospitality will trump anything. No um, question. People will come back for that. No question. But, listen, food has to be good. But yes. the hardest part as a chef was for me to understand that because I thought everything revolved around the kitchen, right? Right. Um, and as an owner, I realized that wasn't true. Wow. Um, and so my, my advice to a young chef yes. would be, number one, if, if you're doing it because you want to get on TV, you're, <laughs> you're, you're doing it for the wrong reason. You're reasons. doing it for the wrong reason. It's not going to happen. Um, and, uh, but if, if you're passionate about food, that's fine. But understand that it, it's, it's like learning any, any skill. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you, have, if you learn three chords on a guitar, yes. you can probably play a lot of songs. And yes. Maybe one day you'll sound pretty good around a campfire. Yes. It doesn't make you a musician. It's true. So it's not about recipes. It's about understanding technique, number one. Learn that. Um, work in as many good restaurants as you can. Um, and work for, give yourself a year. No more than that. Um, also, let that chef know that you're working for, that you'll give them a year, and when you move on, you want them to help you get the next job. Right. Because I can call up my friends that are great chefs and go, I have someone, an employee that's really you know, great, wants to come and work at La Bernard then. Well, Eric Repair is going to pick up the phone and say, okay, send that person. If you go knock on his door, you Make may not have the same, the same outcome. And so stay close to your chef, but also understand that there's a few different things you have to learn. Understand what hospitality and service is all about. You'll need to understand that, but also the business of running the restaurant. Understanding how deals are put together, understanding how to run food costs, how to run a labor cost in your kitchen. Um, you know, making sure you're not wasting anything. Yes, exactly. Um, if you're wasting food, it's food out. So usually waste happens because you're over-purchasing. Wow. Over-purchasing leads to over-prepping. Over-prepping leads to food going in the garbage. That's your profit. Wow. Yeah. And I'm sure very thin margins, you know, like everything else right, that we deal with. So yeah. so many correlators with healthcare, mm -hmm. And, you know, um, part of the reason why I am so passionate about transforming healthcare the same way, and I have a strong hospital. I, I, wait, I, I waited tables. I was a, for years, and I've been around kitchens and chefs. Everyone should. Everyone should, right? Everyone Isn't should. that great advice? Yeah. So you get really true experience on how to work in teams how to manage when the, you know, the kitchen's behind or you know, the food runner issues or whatever it may be. And it's different now because this was pre-computer you know, computer, uh, doing it. And there's so many corollaries to healthcare because you could be the best physician nurse, but if you're not connecting on hospitality on the front end, you don't have a great product. I mean, hospitality comes out of the word hospice. That's right. right. It's all That's about right. care. Yeah. That's right. Amazing. Uh, who are your, let's talk about influencers for you. Like, so when you were coming up, I can still remember some of the physicians and nurses who mm -hmm. made me who I was as a clinician. You, know, I, I, you take pieces from sure. different people. What about you? Um, you know, it's interesting because I didn't work long enough with anyone to say that someone was, was really a mentor. Uh -huh. um, but there were some chefs. I, 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 was, I worked for Thomas Keller um, when he was in New York that uh, made a great impression. And again, not for the reasons that most people would think. Right. He ran a kitchen where the only thing you talked about while you were in that kitchen was food. You didn't talk about what movie you saw the night before, or what bar you were going to go to, or no, you talked about food. Isn't that, that interesting? Was, and he led the conversation. So it was, you know, you know, we have chanterelles and we have rabbit in the restaurant, and we have, you know, whatever vegetable. Let's create something, and then we would all just kind of talk about, wow. what we, and it was a back and forth, and so there was creativity happening, uh, and we were all involved, 
and so he included everybody in that process, which was really, I, wow. I thought, unique and something that no one really talks about when they talk about him, but that's something that I, I learned. There was another chef that I worked for in France named Michel Bra, who I really admired. Um, he was a forager, and he would go on these long runs, and on the way back, he would, he would forage. Um, and there was a real respect for ingredients. Um, uh, Alice Waters, who I never worked for, um, she's, she's a good friend, but you know her um, approach to cooking, which was so simple, um, uh, really resonated with me. Um, the idea that you take perfect ingredients, it helps that she's you right. know, in, in Northern California, sure, where sure. the ingredients are <laughs> often perfect, perfect. And, and they have a much longer growing season. Yes. Um, but um, this idea that you can take a beautiful peach, slice it up, maybe a little cream yeah. or something, that, that's, that's all it. you need to do. That's all you need to um, do. And, um, but uh, certainly uh, chefs like Alfred Portali, who I worked with at a very young age, um, uh, he was just amazing at, at, cr at creating organization in a kitchen where he was able to perform at very, very high level doing 300 covers a night, which is really covers. unheard of. Yeah, and wow. Yeah, <clears throat> just a, a great sense of organization. But there's... And I guess like you, like so a lot of cooks, I don't even remember names anymore, but people that you work next to um, that, you know, they were really good. You had to yes. keep up with them. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, uh, yeah there's, there's a lot, definitely a lot of influence. I'm, I'm watching your face and I'm, I'm kind of reading your thoughts and I'm seeing your emotion and it's just great um, memories yeah. and yeah. kind of what cultivated you. Yeah. And then you, you take that, you package that into who you are. And now, you know, I'm sure our viewers are looking at this and saying, wow, this is fantastic. But talk to us about... Root and Sprig and, and the concept for this and yeah. how this came about. So Root and Sprig actually goes back, I mean, I, we, we started in 2019, but it really goes back um, probably 15 years. Um, we had a, a um, fast casual concept before fast casual was even a, a term right. uh, called witchcraft. Uh -huh. uh, it was an offshoot of craft and it was all sandwiches. Uh -huh. uh, it was spelled W-I-C-H, apostrophe W-I-C-H. And... Um, uh, we we ran that for a long time and it kind of ran out of steam. Yes. And uh, when it came time to, to do something new, the entire team who ran that uh, moved over to to, to, to do Root Sprig. Yeah. And we also right around that time, my longtime assistant uh, Corey Sullivan started working with HHP. Uh, Dan, uh, I think they met it it's in college and um, they got together to form HHP. It was a great idea that Dan had. Yes. Um, uh, based on his experience when his yes. father was in the hospital. Yes. And thought that it was time to bring better hospitality and food to a hospital setting. And so we came, we came along for the ride and we created Root and Spring with them um, to, for specifically to, to uh, um, uh, go into hospitals. And we, and we feel so fortunate to have now this relationship and to grow it throughout all of our you know, six hospitals. We just launched St. Francis. Um, speaking to the deficit of nutrition and, and fresh ingredients, I love the concept of, you know, the fresh food. And talk about the fresh ingredients. Why, why is that so important? And we can start talking a little bit about health, but what you, what you make here really is delicious and nutritious. Mm -hmm. And it's just, you know, changing the way I think for food options for, for all of our employees. It's just fantastic. But why are the fresh ingredients? I think for us, I mean, it's, it, it, I think we've become a country that is, is, uh, um, you know, eating way too much heavily processed food. Yeah. Um, it's causing a lot of, you know, detrimental health outcomes, um, you know, diabetes, heart disease, yeah. um, uh, all, you know, uh, subsets of obesity. Mm -hmm. And so um, the idea that, that you can turn people on to healthier food yes. as an option, something that's not overly processed. Right. Also, we were joking about this when we were going through... Um, uh, you know, the, the, our, our, the kitchen saying, yes. well, there's a lot of colors here, and you got to yes. get colors. Yes. Um, and I think once people uh, sort of under, you know, get used to it, they'll, they'll make different options. So yes. years ago, um, my, my, my wife, um, Lori Silver, she, she you know, did a film called A Place at the Table uh -huh. about hunger in America. And the reason she made that film, she wasn't a documentary filmmaker. She does narrative film, but she was mentoring a young girl. Her family lived in shelters in Brooklyn. And she would come to our house. And this is a kid who never saw a salad, never saw a fresh vegetable. And that's all she wanted. When we started, she would eat with us. And she was like, what is that? She wow. wanted salad. And go, this is amazing. Like carrots and cucumbers and things like that. She loved. And so we would send food home. And then um, uh, we got her into a, she had some learning disabilities. So we got her into a school setting that can, that can yes. uh, meet her needs. But they didn't have a breakfast and lunch program. And so we got a, a call home saying that um, 
Wow. She was clearly hungry. Yes. And that led my wife to, to work on the film. But the point I was making is that a lot of people say, well, these kids don't want this food. If they try it, yes. they'll, 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 they will like yes. it. And usually if you introduce a new uh, ingredient or a new vegetable or something to, to a child, new flavor, you have to do it 12 times before yes. they actually like it. Yes. You can't give up on it. So the idea that, that if we can get people to eat just... If it's that one meal a day, a little healthier. That's right. Um, hopefully, that will lead them to start seeking out a healthier lifestyle. Correct. I, I can't agree more. And I, I tell you, you see this all the time. And when I speak, I, I try to educate folks. So many people, they'll know their credit score or other things. They don't know their A1C level, right? Mm -hmm. They could be pre-diabetic. They don't know their BMI. Mm -hmm. We have obesity, diabetes, two mm -hmm. big, big issues in the country. And, and a lot of it, and hyperlipidemia, high blood, it's all related to food choices. Mm -hmm. And so by bringing fresh, healthy ingredients in that you know taste great, fruits and vegetables, bright colors, all this, you can change someone's health span, mm -hmm. clearly, meaning a longer, healthier life. Right. You know, Hippocrates was the first to say, let food be thy medicine and medicine right. be thy food. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the yeah. quote. But you know the, the the problem that we have in, in doing that um, in this country, you know, uh, calories are cheap, but nutrition is expensive. That's true. You know, if you go to a farmer's market or if you're going to a yes. grocery store, one of the higher end grocery stores, it's expensive to it buy is. good food because it's it highly perishable. It is. Um, and so um, that's something that our, our we need to figure. We need to solve that issue. We do. You know, how do you bring? How do you make healthier food more affordable, more accessible? Obviously. There's plenty of, of, of places in this country where you can't buy a fresh fruit and vegetable. You have to I go know. 20 miles to find something that's I fresh. Know. And so, you know, there's, there's a lot that we can do uh, um, uh, as, a, as a government to alleviate some of these issues. But I'm, I'm, I'm happy that I'm starting to hear the conversation about food as medicine. Mm -hmm. You know, five or six years ago, we started talking about it. Now it's become much more that's prevalent. Right. Um, and uh, it's, it's a change that we all can make. And, and I always say, well, why should we do this? You know, like to complain about the nanny state and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, why should we do this? Well, let's talk, let's talk about children for a second. When kids are going to school hungry, they're not going to live up to their potential. Mm -hmm. And in this day and age, if every single person in this country doesn't live up to their potential, we're going to fall behind. Yes. And so we should do this for a lot of reasons, for national security. I mean, there's, there's you know, people that, that are, are showing up to fight in our armed services are washing out because they're obese and they I can't know. fight. Um, you have, uh, you know, these healthcare outcomes that are just costing a fortune. Yes. And we're trying to understand how do, how do we lower the price That's of right. healthcare? How? That's right. Have healthier people. That's right. How do you do That's that? Right. Introducing, I think the key is we should go back to teaching, we should start teaching nutrition in, in school. Yes. Starting at very young and use the cafeterias as a way to teach nutrition. Yes. Um, and so there's a, there's a lot that we could do. It's, it's, is it a big shift? Absolutely. There is one school, it's a, it's a private school out in Long Island, where the kids actually make lunch. Mm -hmm. And it, it's amazing. Yes. Uh, yeah. And so this, this, is, this could be a model. And Edible Schoolyard, which is a, an organization that Alice Waters started, uh -huh. really focuses on this, this idea that you're having gardens in schools that the yeah. kids are attending, um, that the, depending on the district, you really can't eat out of the garden for right. a lot of reasons, but, but this idea that you're teaching nutrition, and then what happens with those kids, that's why it's so important to teach children. They go home and teach their parents. That's right. The parents are, they're already that's set right. their ways, it's not going to change. Unless, right. the, unless the kids go home and they're saying, I don't want candy, Mom, yeah. I want broccoli, Yeah. I want peas. Yeah, yeah. That's, that uh, well, happens, listen, we I, I, I think you are, you know, cutting edge in this, and we're thrilled to partner with you on, on, on those items, in addition to the work we're doing now, and to look at some of the numbers, New York State alone, over 2.5 million people food insecure, mm -hmm. Long Island, 240,000, 70,000 of those are children, should never happen. And it all starts in the school, and I think also at home. You know, we were talking about this in my home. My, our daughter, she's, you know, she eats like we eat. Um, I don't think she's had fast food ever. Now, we're very blessed. We're fortunate. We've, right. we've been able to afford and get that right. good food in. So we have to find ways to get good, healthier food at a price point that everybody can get school to. School is key. Yeah. Breakfast and, breakfast and lunch at school is key. Yeah. And we have to make healthier choices in school. Yeah. And right now, the big problem is that the school lunch program, um, we moved away from scratch cooking. We're focused more on letting the, these big food companies come in and... and, and, and pretty much do what they, what they want in the cafeteria. Um, and then also, to make up the difference and, and, and have more funding for school lunch programmers, what do the schools do? They put vending machines. I know, I know. And the kids are eating garbage in the vending machines. garbage. And so, it, it, we, we can do change. better. We can do far um, better. There's an organization called Brigade that was started by a, a chef who was a world-class chef um, 
who is, is his sole mission is to get better food um, in, in the schools. My mother ran a school lunch program. This is something I, I, I grew up with. And, That's amazing. And um, she always struggled. You know, I remember you know, when it was, she was quite older, my dad had died, and uh, she would always complain that her legs hurt and her feet hurt. And I was like, Mom, retire. Yeah. And you know, I never thought, you know, I was in my 20s or some, maybe 30s, and I never th thought, you know, I just thought this is, my mom worked later on in life. Yes. I thought this was social time for yes. her, yes. just to get her out of the house, and she was working. And she said something to me that, that just really, you know, stuck with me. And she said, I'm, I can't retire yet. I said, why not? She said, I have to fight every single day to get fruits and vegetables into this, into this wow. program. If I leave, they will stop. They will go to all mass-produced food, and it'll be over. And so if I have three years left, I'm, I need to do wow. this because I care about the kids. Wow. And I never thought about this job that my mother had, like running a school cafeteria as being this noble job. It is. And it completely you know, changed, it, it's, changed my it's, mind. Yeah. It's critical, yeah. and, and, it, and she made a huge yeah. impact. Now, one other thing I know, I don't want to dwell on this, but breakfast. Yes. Now, a lot of people know that there's breakfast before school. Yes. But there's a stigma involved with that. Yes. Kids don't want to show up and, yes. and get breakfast. Also, there's yes. sometimes transportation problems. Yes. So there's a big push to have breakfast in first period. Studies have been done that when kids get breakfast in first period, math scores go up by 13%. Isn't that incredible? And this was a study done by, by Deloitte. It's not well, a... Right. Some, you know... Right. Back of envelope. Right. This is, no, this a, is a major, major firm, firm yeah. real data. Yeah, real data. Right. And, and 13%. Incidence of, of kids going to the principal's office drops. Absentee drops because now kids are going to school for breakfast. Wow. So just the power of food. The power of food. Points. Any teacher in this country, if you ask them if you can raise math scores by 13%, what would you do? Feed someone. You know where the biggest pushback comes from? The custodial staff. They don't want to clean up. Unbelievable. It's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. So you truly are what you eat, huh. right? Um, let's pivot a little bit. And yeah. we have a mutual friend, Jim McCann, yeah. in Smile Forms. That's how I had the privilege to get to meet you. And, right, right. And you were honored you. by, by yeah, Smile Forms. Yeah, a Farms huge and honor. It was, it, was, and it was a great night. It was a great night together. And, you know, out of that, you know, we're doing this cooperative farm with them. And I know you've done incredible work with Smile Forms. Talk a little bit, bit about that. Yeah, so we had a farm, uh, an urban farm, um, that was attached to one of our restaurants. Um, and so... Uh, it wasn't me. Someone in the organization heard of Smile Farms, reached out to them, and they started bringing these young adults in to help. So Smile Farms, uh, kids on the spectrum, yes. um, but it, it, it puts them into homes and so they can be productive adults. Yes. Which is, you know, too often you, we, we focus on kids on the spectrum when they're yes. young, but there's, you know, they become adults. That's right. So Jim has done an amazing job uh, creating, you know, uh, uh, community housing, uh, but they want to work. Yes. Um, and so we would have them working in the farm, and then Within the last couple of years, we actually started a program in our restaurants where they're coming and doing restaurant work, kitchen work, and front of house work too. Um, and it's it's been a, just a great experience. And it, it did something that I didn't wasn't expecting. Um, our teams love it. Um, it's something they're really really proud of. Um, they all feel like they're they're part of they're all they're part of the fabric of our of our of our restaurants now. Um, and then we're helping to, to expand that yes. to uh, other restaurants as yes. well. And it, it, it's great. It really is great. I have a nephew on the spectrum. He's very high functioning, but uh, so it's something near and dear to, Same for to, us. to me. But it's, it's, uh, it, it's, it's just become so important so, to what we do as a company. Um, and I didn't, ex I didn't expect that. It's amazing, yeah. and you know, we're... You, you, know, you expect that you're helping someone, yes. and, and, and it turns out they're, they're helping, helping you. you. Yeah. I just was gonna say that, yeah. you took the words out of yeah. my mouth. And to, you know, we're such fans of, of your restaurants, we've been to all of them, and you see that. It's, it's, it brings this all together, similar to what we do, this sense of community and love, and everybody working together, and the whole product, it, it rises, it just gets better. And I, I think I met Manny at one of your... Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's amazing. Yeah. So it's just wonderful to see. Um, so you're so very active in, in the community, and I know, you serve on the Food Council at City Harvest and Culinary Council at the Food Bank for New York City. You know, we talked a little bit about the issues relating to food insecurity and hunger rel relief. Um, what started that passion in you? Is it just that you got exposed to this in the community, and, or how did it start? No, so I, I, I think that being a working chef in New York City, um, we were always called on when it came to doing fundraisers. Right. So when, when, when Share Our Strength, No Kid Hungry, City Harvest, they do their big events, it was always the, you know, chefs would come provide food, it was a walk around event. And so over the years, you know, I, I, I thought I knew a little bit about the issue. Um, I actually took some media training courses with Share Our Strength. Uh -huh. um, and, uh, you know, 
again, thought I knew a bit about it, and then when my wife decided to do this film, yes. um, it completely changed the thinking too. Wow. Because um, what we found out very quickly, um, that people are not hungry in this country because of famine, because of war, because of drought. They're hungry, and we have enough resources. They're hungry because we don't have the political will to make sure that that's a priority. That's right. Making sure people are fed. That's right. And so that puts us in, it puts now hunger into a very different. That's right. You know, very, you start thinking very differently about it, and also understanding that it's a subset of poverty. Yes. And poverty is a much bigger problem to tackle. Yes. We could tackle hunger. Yes. And so what happened is after the film came out, I was a producer on the film. I was one of the talking heads in the film, and it gave me a, a, a pretty good uh, soapbox to go. Sure. And sure. Um, uh, from there, I started an organization called Food Policy Action. And Food Policy Action, what we did, I, I, I formed it with a guy named Ken Cook, uh -huh. who started the Environmental Working Group. Mm -hmm. And so we would work with the Environmental Working Group, and we published a scorecard. So we graded Congress on a federal level, we graded Congress on how they voted on food issues, mostly hunger, mm -hmm. but also farming issues, fishing issues, clean water, things like that. And um, when we first published our scorecard, people ignored us. Uh, the second year, they started paying attention. Third year, we started hearing politicians say, well, if I knew someone was keeping score, maybe uh, I would have voted differently. Like, see? Exactly. That led to me spending a lot of time up on Capitol Hill. Yes. Lobbying, I was an unpaid, unregistered lobbyist, uh -huh. but I was lobbying on, on behalf of hunger, hungry people, making sure in our, in our um, farm bill, which holds all the nutrition programs, uh, with the exception of uh, school lunch, just really focusing on and really fighting to make sure those programs were as robust as possible. It's so important because so many people, they're not aware of the issue in food security in this country. You no. can't believe it until you get exposed because to it. Because you don't see it. You don't see you it. No, it's not like the commercials that we saw growing up, the Sally Southers commercial, right. the flies buzzing around the kids. Right. It looks very different. It does. So if you're, if you're on, it's like one in five New Yorkers, I think, are, are food insecure. That's right. So you're on a subway. That's right. You look around. There's, Someone's there's food insecurity hungry. there. I know. You just don't know. You don't see it. I know. So it doesn't show up the way it normally does, but it shows up at school. It does. The teachers know. I'll tell you where else it shows up. It shows up in our emergency rooms. Absolutely. And being an ED doc for 18 years, I'd see it. I'd see it in New York City where I worked. When I came here to Long Island, I saw it. And so we wanted to do our part. And, you know, other places, you know, people would come in with a chief complaint of, you know, I feel weak. And, the you know, outside of Catholic Health, and they would ask them, well, why do you feel weak? And the person would say, I haven't eaten in three days. And those institutions would say, well, that's not a medical issue. Right. There's nothing we can do. That's a social service. We said, no, we need to do something about it. Right. So now we screen for it. We provide to-go bags of food, mm -hmm. and then we plug them in with SNAP and other things. I know we were talking right. about SNAP and ways that we can improve right. and get better access Which is to the programs. Most, the most, I think the most important thing is actually advocating on behalf of these people and saying, hey, there's, there's programs. You can, yeah. There's no shame involved here. You can get on board. It's a much easier process now. You get a card versus, you know, it used to be you know, back before they modernized food stamps. It used to be a food stamp program. You had a buy. That's right. Um, so it, it changed a lot. Um, and it still can change. You know, there's one issue, one sort of subset of hunger that we haven't talked about, college campuses. Yes. And yet, the laws around people that are hungry in college, if you want SNAP and you're a college student, you have to work 20 hours a week before you can apply. You're kidding. No. I didn't know that. No. Wow. And so someone who's, who's first generation college student, whose parents are can barely scrape by right. and get in Just school. To get They're not school. buying a meal plan. No. So these kids are on their own. And there's food pantries in every single college campus. I did not know that. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, you know, you think about the issue and the magnitude of the problem. Maybe you and I can go down to Capitol Hill together because I go down and I advocate all the time. And I tell folks, you know, 80% of chronic disease, it's not your genetics. Actually, food insecurity mm -hmm. drives that. So we talked about diabetes. We talked about, look, you look at rates of cancer increasing, and it's no doubt related to poor food choices, and these are things that are most affordable. So I think once the magnitude gets appreciated, there needs to be more public right. policy well, farm, and effort around this. The farm building is being, the farm bill is being debated right now. Um, in fact, I spoke to a member of Congress who's really great on these issues uh, yesterday, and she said probably by September it's going to be wrapped up. So if we're going to go down, we've got to go down soon. So we've got to go down <laughs> soon and, and, and make it happen. Yeah. Um, so uh, I know we've also got a great restaurant uh, on Long Island, Small Batch. We talked about farm to table and fresh foods and things. Tell us a little bit about Small Batch. Um, so Small Batch is, is, is probably our newest restaurant. It opened a couple of years back. And um, we wanted to, to you know, really focus on um, uh, the farms and the wineries in Long Island. 
And so we feature this. I, I have a house out in, in, in Mattatuck, and all <laughs> summer long, I drink local wines. That's great. I drink my neighbor's wines, and, yes. and it's great. And I, I have food out of my garden, but there's a lot of farm stands that I also visit. Yes. And I fish a lot. So mm -hmm. my favorite thing I can do when I'm cooking dinner is either... I caught everything, and I and I and I, <laughs> I, I grew everything. Yes, and my neighbor has the wine. Yes, perfect um, combination. Yeah, and that's so. I, I want to do a restaurant that that mimic that. Um, trying to buy as much local food as possible. Obviously, we do that probably eight months out of the year. Yes. Um, a lot of the local wines are a lot of Long Island people aren't going to drink them. That's they still right. want their California Chardonnay. Yeah, I know. Um, so we we fight that fight. Um, but um, it also, we were looking to do something that was a little you know more medium priced than our. New York restaurants or New York restaurants are on, on the expensive side. And uh, um, we actually partnered with Simon Properties, mm -hmm. and um, uh, which was really interesting. It took a while for that to catch on. And right before the pandemic, we started to see a lot of growth, and then the pandemic just killed yes. us. Yes. Uh, we closed for a period of time. And just over the last three months, I don't know if we did something or if the community finally caught on, but it's all of a sudden gotten busy. Yeah. And it's, it's been great. It's an amazing yeah. place. You know, we, we were just there for, um, for Mother's Day, and I'll tell you, three generations of my family, we, we, it was just fantastic. Oh, that's great. So, I, wish, I wish I'd known you there. Yeah, it was yeah. just fantastic. So, you know, you got a lot on your plate. Uh, so, you know, between the hunger advocacy work, things we talk through, the restaurants, our partnership, the work that you're doing, what, what's next for you? <laughs> well, the hard part is, is three children, <laughs> two teenagers, a 30-year-old, and a, my, my wife and my dog. Um, <laughs> Uh, what's next? Well, it's a good question. We were working on a project in D.C., but the whole thing just got delayed. So we'll we'll see what happens there. Um, uh, you know, I'm slowing down these days, um, trying to anyway. Um, I'm just looking forward to the summer right yes, now. Yes, good. About it. Good for you. Um, I'm 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 in the middle of writing a book, um, Excellent. more of a memoir, not not a straight cookbook. There'll Excellent. be recipes in there, but um, uh, I had noticed during the pandemic when I was doing a lot of Zoom cooking classes and stuff that I, I kept, um, themes kept popping up. Yes. Um, uh, like the story I told yes. earlier about my grandfather. Um, and so I thought it was time to, to get that all down. Well, I, I tell you, I look forward to reading that when yeah. it comes out. I know like everything you do, it'll be a tremendous success. We, we hope. And I, I can't thank you enough for taking the thank time you. to spend with us and, and Catholic Health and with me here today. I'm thrilled about our partnership. I'm thrilled about our work together. And I know we're making a big impact. Well, thanks, thanks. I was uh, I was born in the Catholic Church. I'm, I'm sorry, I was born in the Catholic hospital. Yes. Um, so uh, um, it brings back, I guess, a lot of memories right down the street from where I grew up in, in Elizabeth, New Jersey. Yes. It was uh, St. Elizabeth's. Now I think it's part of Centus, but not Centus. Um, I forget what hospital system it's now part of, but uh, uh, it's it great, great chatting with you. Yeah, and I got to tell you, you know, same thing. So growing up the same way, and I think... Uh, the nuns in the school where I grew up had the same uh, prayers about me as yeah, they did you. Yeah. Uh, well, I guess someone answered those prayers. Yeah, I don't know. Someone answered them. <laughs> I guess someone answered them. <laughs> this was great. Thanks. I can't thank yeah. you enough. Sure. Wonderful.